I thought I'd start by introducing Artist as Family, the, the kind of roles that each of us play. We are uh, actors of economies of regard, we call ourselves, to, to riff off a, a, a wonderful artist called Peter Tyndall. His actors of regard have, have, um, is, is his meme. Um, but economy is a big part of our practice. In fact, it's, it's the place in which we start. Um, there isn't a presum presumption that there is food in the refrigerator before we start to make as artists. That's a that's our kind of um, a sort of a beginning point, if you like. Um, so I'm going to just go through the members of Artists' Family, uh, which is a collaborative collective, but I think the core members are um, our family unit. So Meg, um, the mentor, mother of cultural and biological regeneration, also the breadwinner and bread maker, co-bread maker. Zaf, our protector of youth, um, converter of energies and waste, uh, voice of dissent, <laughs> or in his language, gangster. <laughs> Woody, uh, a cute eye for hidden treasures, particularly mushrooms and berries agent of openness and possibility. Zero, he's our de-anthropicizing master of ceremonies, our chief rabbiter and wild bird shewer, bringer of endless love and antimicrobial dog lick medicine. <laughs> uh, myself, um, father, theorist, laborer of non-money economies, rat bag refuser of dominant hegemonies and th the land the gardens the forest nearby forests our walked for locosphere uh, that we are in partnership with um, on a day-to-day -day, moment by moment uh, relationship and of course our community and our community kin are our other collaborators um, Again, our practice is very much based on um, our food and energy resources and how they are derived. Um, so the practice doesn't exclude, but is not, we don't include continental philosophy as our major material for production. Um, that is, philosophy of course exists as one small part of the whole picture. The Jajurong people who we, whose country we reside on, we are borrowers of their modes of acting in regard to earth others. The respect, the, the kinds of things we borrow is the respecting of the animals and the acknowledgement of the earth others, all parts, both as a sacred economy and as, uh, as kin, as, as nearby kin. Uh, Bioregional accountability is central to our practice. Our household economics is, is about 40% now reliant on the monetary economy, uh, that big global blob uh, where people's dreams are hinged. Um, permapoesis is a term that We've developed to describe permanent making, which comes from permaculture. Um, the, again, borrowing from traditional peoples of place, um, the long held relationships to land and economy that indigenous and peasant and agrarian um, peoples have established um, and shown us the modes in which economy um, and ecological intelligence uh, invite one another or enmesh. Um, our resources are mostly walked for or bicycled for. Um, and we are, I, I guess, in a sense, um, using the digital age to create a digi, digi peasant um, modality in our art practice. Um, that's probably enough of an introduction. Um, there's been a lot said about um, 
economy today. Um, we've seen some really big picture, um, large scale um, developments and ideas with wind farms and um, you know, the political uh, project um, uh, is, is a large scale uh, project. Um, and those things we are certainly involved in and, and they are not um, externalities. However, it is um, the actions, uh, the day-to-day -day actions that uh, we are most focused on. How we get, how we move around, what is our mobility, and where do we get our basic resources. And that, and raising kids, of course, is, is, a, is a big part of that because it's, it's the handing down of such uh, knowledge as succession as our peasant and indigenous ancestors uh, have shown us for millennia. Um, that's probably enough for me. Thanks. Um, just to kind of, um, as a way of leading or linking these two entities, um, in some ways, you know, um, this morning there was, um, uh, Adam mentioned the idea of the annoying example, and um, part of why, why I love both of these entities is because they are exemplary. They choose to be exemplary. In that sense, to a certain extent, they come out of a tradition of avant-garde performance art, which is about um, taking on, put, turning one's own body and oneself into a kind of exemplary character for, um, for the provocation of others. And both Milkwood Permaculture and Artist as Family um, really, you know, there's this online presence which where their own lives are constantly <coughs> exposed and with all of the difficulties and problems and successes and achievements in these attempts to live um, lives um, which uh, embody um, some of the principles that we've been talking about for the last couple of days, questions around how to move away from growth economies and so on. Kirsten and her partner Nick from Milkwood Permaculture, I have learned so much from them in terms of being a student in their uh, permaculture design course, but also in watching them um, transform their own lives from being um, media artists um, and experimental VJs into being large-scale community educators around the permaculture scene. So um, that's just by way of introduction to Kirsten, and you, you can continue. And <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm representing Milkwood, my partner and co-founder Nick is teaching mushrooms in Sydney this weekend so he sends his apologies but he can't be here at the same time. Um, as Lucas said my background is as a media artist and about 10 years ago we did that thing that youngins sometimes do when the, the parents that have a farm say why don't you come and build a house at our place and after years of going ha <laughs> as if I'm going to leave the city and go and live with you. Um, something clicked and shifted for us and we said yes, we'd love to come and live near Mudgee, just on the other side of the highway from, from Candos. And yeah, we'll, we'll come and build a little shack out of mud and sticks and, and see what we can make of it all. Um, and we were moving to the country and at that point we did what I thought you were meant to do when you move to the country, which is to do a PDC which is a permaculture design certificate, which is a two-week course that aims to skill people up with ways of looking at holes and systems thinking within landscapes and usually manifests as hopefully well-designed farms or systems or gardens or houses. And um, yeah, so we, we went off and did this two-week course before we moved to the farm and we got completely sideswiped by the... the just the, the knowledge bank that was permaculture, which was coming from agroecologies, which was coming from regenerative agricultures from all over the world. These days, we're now living in a much smaller farm situation down in Victoria, just down the road from this lovely family, um, which is a wonderful coincidence for us. And, um, and yes, but still the thrust, the, the scale of the farming practice that we're now involved mm. in is much smaller, but it's around the same ethos of, you know, keep things as small as possible, keep things as closed loop as possible. This weekend has been amazing for me because there's been all these speakers like Stuart Andrews, we've worked with Stuart's dad, Peter, um, all these uh, different and amazing people coming from the agricultural end of things and having mostly artists being in the room 
has been wonderful to sort of see through a lot of your eyes um, in a way with my previous eyes when I was a media artist, being able to sort of yeah reconnect through you guys into how these agricultural practices and land practices and land ecologies um, intersect with art in Australia at the moment. And I'm, I'm really excited and really curious as to what will come out of this weekend in terms of where this knowledge bank that's being introduced to you guys, where that will where that will flow and follow to. Mm. Yeah. So, um, Helen, so just following on from that, I guess I'd just like to invite um, Kirsten and uh, Meg and Patrick, if you have particular um, things that you've noticed or reflected upon from this weekend that you'd like to uh, introduce us to as a way of starting the reflective conversation. Hi everyone. Um, I've been thinking a lot this weekend about education and the way that we've been schooling ourselves for the last couple of days. Um, we've got two boys, uh, Zephyr and Woody, both of whom we home educate or community educate as we like to say. Um, so I've been thinking, just wanted to open up the broader discussion about education really and about how we communicate ideas, um, how we teach ourselves and each other and our next generation and yeah, that's, that's it really, just about the broader um, yeah, notion of education. Mm. If anyone else has got some thoughts about that? Hi, um, I'm a, my name's Kate, I'm a homeschooler, or at least I have been until just now when my youngest has left home. Uh -huh. um, I brought my children through high school <coughs> and uh, the eldest started her university degree in biogenetics at 16. So please don't think that homeschool is just for country hicks. With, it's also for country intelligence. And um, what we've learnt together, really, we can't teach ourselves. Um, you know, this is how come there's an Aboriginal heritage of knowledge that's the mine, a little bit of it, is left to tap and fill in the gaps of what's been taken. That those eons of knowledge and wisdom really need to be gained again because it's a huge loss to Australia. But what we teach our children from our conclusions and our investigations, that can also go on for aeons. Mm. So um, please remember our next generation. I might just, before Diego takes off, I might just respond to that. I, I um, a few years ago, wrote a, wrote, um, just hang on that word, wrote a paper about the problem of writing um, in terms, or, or sort of questioning writing's place in anti-ecological cultures, um, which is online and I won't sprout on about it, but um, orality and storytelling and this direct um, means of um, uh, narrative production and passing on um, is uh, it, it feels much more mycelial, um, rhizomal, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm an, I, part of my life is as a scholar, and um, I'm I find the most isolatory part of my practice is the theorizing of it. I'm doing that intentionally not, I haven't got to a stage where I, I wanted to walk away from that. But, but the most energized and most engaged practice that artists as family practice is, um, is embodied in community and in, in, in oral storytelling. Um, and it's, it, it, while obviously, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Things that, uh, that, that really struck me, that uh, the single step, the, the learning curve, happened on the very first blog post from milkwood.net. You load up the car about 10 years ago, mm. driving from Melbourne to Maji. Plenty of possibility, plenty of fear. What the hell are we doing here? You know, let's go for this great adventure, you know, and from there on, we all followed you, yeah? 
So, um, um, education can happen in many ways. Uh, I learned a lot from examples, uh, uh, incredible examples of Kirsten, of you guys, you know, traveling around Australia with a bicycle far out. You know, just incredible, so much to, to, to gather from that. And uh, on free food, travel around Australia on free food. And, and one thing that uh, education happened in many levels, happened by learning by examples, but also happened most importantly on doing. I was speaking this morning with Les about uh, the importance of doing things, the importance of learning by action, the importance of not just reading, talking, hearing, and um, watching YouTube clip, reading PDFs, and reading books. That's all too good, but if you don't do it, you don't get it. Mm. I was reminded um, um, of this when I spent, I spent some fantastic time with an elder, Jim Wallace, years back, which passed away two years back in Nara. And uh, we did incredible things together, I learned incredible things from that man. A man with incredible knowledge of weaving, who was teaching back practice in communities. Just himself going and do it until he learned it and then teach it back. He was saying, you cannot just read about things, you need to do it. Because by doing it, you got all the information that you would never get from a YouTube clip. That's so, education happens at different levels. The embodiment of knowledge, the embodiment of learning experience, is not to be undervalued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have not so much as a question, but something that's really sitting with me after hearing our amazing speakers this weekend, and it it's got to do with with weeds, which is a subject dear to to many of our hearts. And in permaculture design, we talk a lot about using whatever species is necessary to perform an ecological function um, in order to take the landscape or take a soil base where you would like it to go. And a lot of us are advocates for um, things like the ideas of novel ecosystems, which is basically a mishmash of whatever plants have established themselves if they are naturalising and forming functional relationships within the ecosystems and with the, the, the rest of the life in that ecosystem, then maybe there's a place to look at why that is happening and how that is happening rather than assuming that it's up to all of us to eradicate everything that wasn't there at some point in the past. But listening to Bruce and listening to Terry, um, I am wondering... I've really noticed you've got the mostly coming from, you know, Euro-Mongol traditions or purebred Italian in some cases, um, us talking about these weeds and their functions and how they can repair landscapes and how they, you know, can be viewed as, as friends in, in our work of rehabilitation and yet having the Indigenous perspective and wondering where weeds fit into that from the perspective of, you know, here's another layer of invasion, essentially, but not invasion as as we were talking about, but as a, a cultural invasion, essentially. And I don't have an answer, and I didn't get a chance to ask Bruce what he thought before he left this morning, but it's that's a whole big question that I'm sitting with at the moment and just wondering. I mean, that that certainly is that certainly is our response is to for us to enact our creaturely, to, to, to enact a kind of creaturely accountability is to be the biological controls of those ancestral plants that have come with in the last 230 years. Um, there is also, I mean, my, again, it's the borrowing um, that Artis's family uh, look to um, indigenous voices and ideas around this, and there is plenty across Australia uh, of, of indigenous communities who have very quickly adapted um, who, 
bush tucker doesn't stop at 1788. Um, we've been on Palm Island, we've been up right up uh, on our bicycles, right up to um, uh, Cape York, to a, a community called Hope Vale, and there are a lot of newcomer species that are new bush medicines and new bush tucker species. That are, there isn't this um, maybe southern Australian white fella idea of or duality or polarizing duality um, between 1788 and post 1788. Uh, I, I find the pragmatism of Aboriginal people um, really inspirational um, and 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 less ideological. Um, and and I, I I think that for non-Indigenous people to keep looking at the modes and models and listening to the, the those stories that Aboriginal people are willing to share with us, that's that's what we have. That's what we have to refer to. And there is plenty of evidence that wild boar is, is, is a, a very important part of economies up north in, in the north of the country, and as, they, as it is down south. I couldn't agree more with uh, some of those sediments, call it pragmatism, um, but it's really important to us to continue to learn. Where in the south southeast it's been taken away in the main, uh, we can still learn, learn by doing. Um, and what we try to do in our own particular thinking is to um, have, form as many partnerships as possible. It spreads the biodiversity of knowledge um, and a partnership on an equivalence level means that we both get something out of it. It's not us handing knowledge to you, um, although I do Aboriginal archaeology, uh, I have done for a number of years, and what we find in that kind of relationship is that it's unequal because they're learning off us we're not getting a lot back. Mm. But the kind of partnership you're talking about, I think, um, inspires me too. Because we can go away and start thinking about how. How do we go about doing this kind of thing? Mm. Thank you. Mm. That's fantastic. I'm kind of a very urbanised person. So being out in the bush is a bit different, I suppose. But one of the things I think a lot about is the way in which um, kind of private property allotments shape the way in which plants grow in cities. I mean, it's an obvious statement, I suppose. But, you know, like the particular row of trees that run along one neighbour's fence and the very, very different one on the other side of the fence and how... And, and also, I suppose, in the private property kind of domestic allotment context, how weeds are sort of policed and also how weeds grow up on the edges. Um, and I sort of feel a little bit overwhelmed by, you know, how you go about a project of decolonisation, not just about plants, but sort of humans as well, with these kinds of land divisions in that really strict way um, along kind of title. Because I suppose private property in Australia is the story of dispossession, or the creation of private property is the story of dispossession. Mm. Um, so it's interesting to think plants in that context mm. as well, I suppose, mm. um, which I do often and I don't really know. You know, I obviously, I think we, I don't, what I'm saying is, you know, obviously, I don't think weeds are entirely amazing just universally, but they kind of do interesting things at the edges of properties that might be worth mm. thinking about more. Mm. So there's, um, in the bush, uh, in the little forest, we, we live in a kind of suburban town outside of Melbourne in central Victoria on Jajurong country, as I was saying. And um, so it, it, it's a quarter acre, um, intensively gardened, indigenous newcomer species, food producing garden, I suppose. But just, just uh, in a short walk to us, um, we have been performing with our community neighbors 
um, and into other interested parties, uh, a kind of guerrilla land management um, mo modeling, I suppose, um, th that, uh, that looks at all the different um, newcomer and old timer species and, and observes, uh, observes their interactions, their, their intelligences, their uh, relationships. And one of the things that uh, we discovered early on was the how the hawthorn, which is um, an ancestral medicine tree of, of, of my European indigenous ancestors, um, and, and of course uh, producing a, a berry that, that we use on a, a regular basis in our household um, medicinal um, pharmacopoeia, if you like, um, but how that tree has become the most significant uh, habitat tree for the ringtail possum, which isn't critically endangered, but it is, um, it is a, a declining species. They haven't adapted to anthropogenic settlement like the brush tail. And so all these beautiful big old trees with, um, with hollows in them have, have disappeared. Um, and so to stop the powerful owls and the foxes from eating the ringtail possums, um, the ringtail possums have built these remarkable drays uh, in the hawthorns. Um, and that, that science has no status where we live. Ecologists apply no status to the hawthorn. And there are many, many examples of this happening in Australia. And, and this is, for me, this is the sort of thing that stops reconciliation. That we're not observing in non-human life the relationships that are occurring. <laughs> makes me very emotional. Um, the plants and animals and fungi and bacteria, if we could see it, um, I'm sure, we, well, we see it through our bread making and fermentations. Um, they're, they're in placing far more, uh, far more advanced and sophisticated than I think non-Indigenous Australians. And I, I guess I put that as a comment for discussion um, rather than an absolute. Um, so my comment is actually really connected to that. It's interesting, um, and to you and to the weeds, because I was. It just suddenly occurred to me that we've been talking a lot about weeds um, in various different ways, and how they um, are. They kind of stand for a metaphorical form of um, healing that we kind of have. I think potentially within every single person. So there's something wild that just pops up and there's so many seeds in the soil and who knows when they'll sprout and what they'll do. But um, what uh, Stuart and Andrews was saying yesterday is that they often uh, will be the ones that need to be for the soil. So in some ways I think it's a really beautiful metaphor for um, the weeds inside of everybody and the, the those sort of undomesticated and surprising, un rat baggy kind of uh, not really wanted bits that we really need to cultivate, maybe not even cultivate, we just need to enjoy within ourselves and encourage, maybe cook with, maybe, who knows, ferment with, um, while we, we can maybe use that as a path towards um, bringing something that still works between non-Indigenous and Indigenous people. I don't know exactly mm. if that makes sense, but mm. that's just what pops into my mind. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Mm. So in the Northern Rivers region, we have camphor laurel that has established at a phenomenal rate. Mm. And the koalas live in that, but it kills them. Mm. And that's the complexity of trying to work out, you know, um, what species do we bring in, what species don't we bring in, and your comment that ecologists don't comment. Um, no, don't give status. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very complex thing because if you speak, if I speak to academics who are at Southern Cross Uni, they'll say that we can't cut those campers out now because they've, for 80 years they've become part of that system. Mm. So it has to be some sort, sort of slower eradication of the camper, but nevertheless it probably needs to be an eradication of the camper. And I don't know the impact of Hawthorn, but the fact that it stays here or it survives doesn't necessarily mean that that's something that we should 
fully embrace. And I suppose that I see it, and if this is really a personal view, is that we, whenever we introduce a new species, um, we really need to think about what was that indigenous, you know, what was here, mm. and what actually serves to maintain that. Um, mm. Because life is tricky and sometimes it's a poison that acclimatises and becomes available to you. Mm. Mm. And we need to recognise that, mm. that as well. It's, a, it's you know, so I'm just, I suppose, commenting on the complexity of it. Mm. That mm. it's, and tink yeah. often seeds are brought in from overseas mm. and um, people don't necessarily think about the complex things attached to that, including soil disease. And I personally had the experience where I accidentally brought in Instead of bringing hemp seed, I had been told that I was buying hemp seed from China and it wasn't hemp seed at all. Mm. It was amber hemp seed but had all the paperwork of hemp seed. So the, I'd waited the three months, got the perf all the perfect paperwork and I'd obviously been, you know, um, misled. And then as it turned out, what I'd brought in actually carried anthrax. Mm. Whereas hemp seed doesn't carry anthrax. Mm. So soil borne pathogens from other continents mm. I, th I think we need to think mm. and consider really carefully. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I noticed in my studying and uh, cycling and all the other projects I had is that uh, the savannah plays an important part in everybody's psyche. Mm. That's something that we're basically all born with, no matter where we are born on the globe. We have this instinctual liking for the savannah and that's one of the things I've also noticed with mosaic planting as described by Bill Gamage and Bruce Pascoe, uh, farming without fences, is the fact that we still have uh, large areas of savannah, so the lawn type areas, so that uh, foraging animals will come and be, become eventually a prey species. Um, but you also have those uh, areas that are secluded off, so without a fence, but with barriers of some sort. So you might have a, a thick thicket thicket of undergrowth, whereas the woodland might be um, slow burned or cool burned, so that it's clear and open. So there's all of these husbanding, husbanding and tending activities that we should be paying more attention to, I think, and that should be coming up more in the discussion about how we actually reincorporate that back into either natural sequence farming or the other farming practices that we're all interested in. Hmm. Thanks. Well, my name's Diana and I've worked in education all my life and uh, with children of all ages. And, um, and one of the things I ma always made a point of, sometimes going well against the grain, was to take the kids outside for, you know, little excursions. Very cheap uh, on many occasions and sometimes a weekend away camping and what I uh, emphasised to these kids was to be observant of their environment, to be observant of the land and the rocks and the leaves and how they changed and they were different and how they all related to each other. And um, so we had had many um, wonderful times with these little excursions and uh, trips and some of these kids I met much later in their life, when they were in their 40s and 50s, and some of them said to me that these, uh, these trips were, were the things they learnt the most of from in, in their education um, for, for growing up and becoming an adult and living their, their, um, their lives. So that was <laughs> really uh, nice to hear. Um, but I just think with, with the youth suicide rate that's so high at the moment that what you were just saying, you know, is so important. So important for, for young people to have some culture and to learn to relate to their, to their land and their, their, their environment and their plants and the ocean um, and, and that it needs to be done in a very practical community sort of living way. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Mm, beautiful.